This is Standing Watch. And now, Evangelist Norbert Link. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to our Standing Watch program. Some time ago, several years ago to be exact, we have asked the question whether and when Israel is going to attack Iran. And at that time, people have written us and have said that's never going to happen and that's ridiculous to even consider the possibility. Something was revealed this week which I believe was extremely interesting. The New York Times wrote on August 21, a former Israeli defense minister, Ehud Barak, revealed new details to his biographers about how close Israel came to striking Iran's military facilities in 2010, 2011, and 2012, and why it did not, despite his and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's desire to do so, according to interview excerpts aired on Israeli television Friday night. Mr. Barak, who also previously served as Israel's Prime Minister, said that he and Mr. Netanyahu were ready to attack Iran each year, but that in 2010, the military chief of staff said Israel lacked the operational capability. In 2011, two key ministers waffled at the last minute, and in 2012, the timing didn't work out because of a joint United States-Israeli military exercise and visit by the American Defense Secretary. He noted that the two ministers who balked in 2011, Moshe Yalon and Juval Steinitz, are the most militant about attacking Iran today. Mr. Barak was known at the time to be a prime advocate for a unilateral Israeli military strike on Iran's nuclear plants, something Washington strongly opposed. In the weeks since, the Obama administration and five other world powers signed a deal with Iran to restrict its nuclear program, Mr. Netanyahu, Mr. Jalon, now Defense Minister, and Mr. Steinitz have all stressed that Israel retains a military option to stop Iran from making a bomb. It's obvious that at the time there were strong considerations to attack Iran, but the timing wasn't right. It was stopped. It wasn't part of God's plan then. But Iran hasn't changed its modus operandi. They are still willing, very clearly, to destroy Israel. Newsmax reported on August 23. Two weeks after the Iran nuclear deal was announced, a video was released under the auspices of the Iranian regime, which depicts an attack on Jerusalem by the Revolutionary Guard Corps and its Muslim allies. The video declares Israel must be obliterated. The animated video produced by the Islamic Revolution Design House shows soldiers preparing for battle. One has the Revolutionary Guard insignia on his arm, another sports the emblem of the Iran-based Iraqi Shia Badr organization, and a third wears a headband with Hezbollah's logo. The soldiers are seen then marching towards Jerusalem's Temple Mount and Old City. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has also called for the destruction of Israel. He recently tweeted, we spare no opportunity to support anyone fighting the Zionists. Now, when we think in terms of the deal which has been struck, the question is why would anybody strike such a deal? What are the motives? What are the motives? The mass tabloid built online the mass tabloid in Germany, published an article on August 26 asking the question, is what happens now the beginning of the Great War? And they point out, of course, that there were attacks from Syria. Syria sent four missiles into Israel. Israel responded, attacked 14 places in Syria and killed the attackers in the process. And the paper says that these are the greatest fightings, the biggest fightings between Israel and Syria since 1973, the famous Yom Kippur War. Now, the British 
Foreign Minister Philip Hammond visited Iran and he talked about that Iran is taking now a more differentiated position, something which Iran immediately denied. It reminded me of what happened prior to World War II when the British Prime Minister visited Adolf Hitler. The article says that by now 100,000 missiles are positioned in Lebanon directed towards Israel and that between 6,000 to 8,000 8, soldiers are fighting for Assad against whoever they're fighting against, but it's of course Hezbollah soldiers fighting there. The article also says that once the deal goes through, $100 billion will be given immediately to Iran. And they say that, of course, much of that will go to Hezbollah, supporting their fight against Israel. So again, we're asking the question, why would anybody sign such a deal with Iran, knowing what they have in mind, knowing what they want to do? Those countries supporting the deal may have similar concepts, some of them, as Iran does when it comes to Israel, but most certainly not all of them do. Not everybody is for the destruction of Israel, at, this, not at, this, at least not at this point. But what is the real motive at this point? What is the real motive behind this deal? I found the following article by the Washington Post dated August 21 very interesting. And I'd like to quote it to you in this fashion. It says, Congress is still deciding whether to approve the landmark nuclear deal with Iran, but European political, political and business leaders are not waiting for the outcome. It's a measure of the radically different views on the deal on either side of the Atlantic. There is little opposition to the nuclear pact in Europe and little appetite to reimpose sanctions if Congress nixes the deal. And now listen carefully what already has happened and what is supposed to happen. German Vice Chancellor Sigmar Gabriel rushed to Tehran in the days after the agreement was signed, traveling alongside a business delegation with top officials from some of Germany's largest companies, including Daimler, Siemens and ThyssenKrupp. Krupp, the very firm, famous organization or company which provided weapons to Hitler's Germany. French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius visited Tehran in late July. A French business delegation of nearly 100 executives will visit Tehran at the end of September. Top French firms, including Renault, Peugeot, have all visited in recent months. Italian Foreign Minister Paolo Gentiloni and Economic Development Minister Frederica Giuidi visited Tehran in early August, extending an invitation to President Rouhani to visit Rome. They traveled with a delegation of Italian financial firms, and bankers signed a government-backed financing deal to jumpstart Italian investment in Iran. British Foreign Secretary Philip Hammond, the guy we quoted earlier, plans to visit Tehran on Saturday to reopen his nation's embassy there, which has been closed since it was stormed by protesters in 2011. He will be accompanied by top British business leaders, amid fears that they were lagging behind other countries in the rush to deal or to do deals with Iran. Austrian President Heinz Fischer plans to visit Tehran in early September, becoming the first European head of state to visit since 2004. He plans to travel with the foreign and economic ministers and other top business leaders. Vienna hosted a major EU-Iran trade conference just a week after the deal was signed. Spain's foreign minister Jose Manuel Garcia Margallo, industry, energy and tourism minister Jose Manuel Soria and development minister Anna Pastor will lead a trade delegation to Tehran in early September. Polish economic minister Janusz Piotrowski plans to visit Tehran in September with a business delegation. The country has started a development initiative called Go Iran to promote between the two countries. And Swedish minister for enterprise Mikhail Damberg will visit with a trade delegation in the fall. So it's very obvious 
why these deals are taking place. It's all about money. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about modern Babylon. It's going to be the final and last revival of the ancient Roman Empire in Europe. And it's described as an extremely powerful economic organization on top of becoming a very powerful military organization. It's described also as modern Tyre in the book of Ezekiel. And there it's also described as a powerful trade organization. You need to know what is prophesied in your Bible. What do we make out of these dealings, especially between Europe and Iran and other Middle Eastern countries? We have prepared a booklet, Middle Eastern and African Nations in Biblical Prophecy. And of course, this talks about Iran. This talks about other countries, and it shows you from the pages of the Bible what is prophesied. Now, when it comes to Israel, we have another booklet prepared, the book of Zechariah, prophecies for today, the book of Zechariah. You might be surprised how many prophecies dealing with the end time pertaining to the state of Israel are mentioned in the Bible, are mentioned in this booklet. You need that information if you really want to know what is happening and why. Thank you very much for listening. This is Norbert Link for the Standing Watch program. Standing Watch is a presentation by The Church of the Eternal God, P.O. Box 270519, San Diego, California, 92198. More information is also available at our website, eternalgod.org.